Thank you very much, and uh, good morning to everyone. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here in, in Cyprus, and I, I can only apologize for having brought Scotland's weather with me. Um, is this my one? Yeah, I, I was just checking it was my one. Okay, perfect. Um, I get invited to speak at lots of uh, events about research data, in particular in Open Access Week, because there's a very strong relationship between open access to research publications and to research data. And I'd like to begin by making you raise your hands. Can I ask, before this Open Access Week, can you raise your hand if you were aware of or familiar with open access to publications? Okay. That's, yeah, you, you knew. Uh, okay, so that's about, about half. Um, same question, before this Open Access Week, how were you aware of open access to research data and data management and data sharing? Okay, a significantly smaller number, uh, 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 it, very much in single figures. The reason why I ask this is, is one, to emphasize that research data management and open access are two parts of a very similar conversation. Uh, and also that the conversation around research data management follows the pattern established by open access to research publications, usually one cycle behind. That cycle may be uh, a European framework program, or it may be um, an internal spending review or funding review, such as the research excellence framework uh, that Victoria mentioned uh, in the United Kingdom. So it is possible to watch carefully what happens within the open access space and predict what will happen in the open data space. So part of my talk, my talk will focus almost exclusively on research data, um, but I, d I just want to, uh, from the outset, make it very clear that there is this very, very close link between uh, the two, between publications and data for very good uh, reasons. Now, I can speak for many hours about this if, if required. I don't believe that the time uh, permits for that. So can somebody please let me know uh, when I have about five minutes left so that I don't make the event overrun. I have a tendency to do that. So just to begin, a, a few words about the Digital Curation Centre, which is the, the centre in the United Kingdom which I represent. We are the UK's uh, centre of expertise in uh, digital preservation and research data management. And we've been around for slightly more than 10 years. We began from the um, ePrints community, the digital preservation of electronic journals, and as time went by, we expanded our provision and our focus uh, to concentrate almost exclusively on uh, digital data and research data in particular. Uh, the way in which we support the UK community and more, more widely, uh, we provide guidance and training and tools and other kinds of services on all the aspects of research uh, data management. We also organize get-togethers, national and international events, uh, and increasingly webinars as people uh, like to uh, dip into conversations rather than devote an entire day to uh, attending things. We run uh, online training and online awareness raising sessions. Um, our principal audience is and has been the UK higher education sector, uh, but there's increasing amounts of European collaboration, of, of international collaboration, and, we're, and the work that we do uh, is increasingly focused on uh, Europe, and we have uh, friends and colleagues and customers in North America, South Africa, uh, and we're off offering tailored consultancy and training beyond the United Kingdom for the first time uh, now. So what I intend to talk about over the next uh, 30 minutes or so um, is I'll give a little bit of background and context. The, the, there weren't many hands when I asked who was aware of research data management, so I will give very much an introductory overview of the, the, what research data management constitutes and uh, what, what, it, what its benefits are, um, what the problems are with research data management and what it actually means for researchers, not, not only for researchers, but for anyone involved in the research process, a, a, any stakeholder there. And I'll conclude with some useful resources that you can uh, look at after the event and see if they are useful to your own, uh, your own context. So, in terms of background, I mentioned that research data management and open access to research publications are very closely 
aligned conversations. And they both exist within a broader context, in, especially in public life, uh, of ever greater transparency, of accessibility and of accountability. And the, the impetus for, um, for openness in research, as Victoria mentioned earlier, comes not only from the policymakers from the top down, uh, where the funders say you must do this because it's beneficial for impact or it's beneficial for value for money, but also from the ground up in that open, the open access movement originated from scholars in the high energy physics um, research community. They saw benefit in sharing their research findings more quickly than the traditional publishing time frame uh, would allow. They also saw benefit and indeed necessity in sharing not only the publications quite quickly, but the code and the data which serves as the evidence for those publications. Effectively, they are, the publication is a description of a process which is empirically driven, uh, which depends on data. Not always the case, not, certainly not in all of the uh, academic disciplines, in particular the arts and humanities have a, a, a different uh, methodology and the scientific method isn't uh, applicable to every, um, to every scholar of the community. But similarly, the term data is quite a broad church uh, in that it, it can refer not only to um, access to, or to SQL databases, to spreadsheets, but also to audiovisual information, transcripts of interviews, all that kind of stuff. It all fits under uh, the, the, the catch-all term uh, of data. So the, the goals of these developments of openness in scholarly communication uh, are to lower barriers to accessing the outputs of scholarly uh, research. Um, w when we talk about open science, again, that's a shorthand for open research. I come from an arts background and sometimes get a little bit upset when people equate science and research as being, uh, as being equal uh, terms. Obviously, um, re research is a broader uh, term than merely science, but uh, it, it, it works as shorthand. These developments speed up the research process and they strengthen, and this is a fundamental, uh, the quality, the integrity, and the longevity of the scholarly record. And I'll explain a little bit about these things. I'll unpack them uh, in the next little while. So the old way, before the advent of um, networked computers and the widespread uh, availability of uh, cheap sensors, uh, would be that a researcher would collect a data set, and maybe that this would be an analog data set, or they might not even consider it data, but more information. So that data or that information, that evidence base would be collected. The researcher would interpret, occasionally synthesize that data, by which I mean uh, read it against other data sets to see whether it threw up any interesting um, conclusions. The researcher would write a paper or a book uh, based on that data. The paper would be published, and via the process of publication, the research would be preserved, or the findings of the research would be preserved. But the data which underpins that research would be left to what we would call in the archival community benign neglect, uh, in that it would be left on, it would either be analog, it would be paper, it wouldn't be deposited alongside the, um, uh, the, the papers. Uh, it may very well be digital, but not deposited in a repository. It may be stored on USB keys, which uh, can easily be lost, especially if they're attached to your, uh, your key ring, which you pull out of your pocket several times each day. Um, they, it may be on an old computer that gets replaced and everything isn't moved across. It may be on an old computer which breaks and, and cannot be uh, fixed because it wasn't backed up anywhere. So that's what we call benign neglect. Nobody actively wishes this stuff harm, but eventually it ceases to be accessible if you don't take steps to make it um, uh, to, to make it accessible. So that's the old way of doing research, and it was done by necessity. There, 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 weren't, there wasn't a better way uh, of doing things. Um, and a study done a couple of years ago by uh, Timothy Vines and his colleagues uh, looked at the availability of research data over time, and this is a, um, a paper from uh, Current Biology last year. What, what, what Vines and his colleagues did uh, was look at the availability of data from more than 500 studies uh, of between two and 22 years old. And they found that as time went by, the chances of being able to access the data, which was the evidence behind a research publication, would fall by 17% each year, meaning that almost all of it would be lost over time. In, 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 over a 20-year period, 80% of data, and this is the evidence for 
uh, research publications is lost. It's inaccessible. It either can't be got at all or it can't be understood. Um, this, to Vines and to many others, underscores the need um, for um, passing of custody of research data from the researchers themselves, the people who collect the data, into dedicated hands, be it from a data center, a repository, somebody like that. In the same way that you publish a book and then somebody wants to access that book, you don't invite them into your lab to look at the book on the shelf, you actually put it in a library so that they can find it. It's the same principle for research data. It's the place to, to find and access data. Uh, researchers themselves do not make the best stewards, the best long-term stewards of their data. Uh, not least for the fact that the data in many cases will be interesting for longer than the actual lifetime of the researcher. If you're looking at longitudinal studies, census information, it will be interesting long after the people who have collected the data have ceased to either work in the field or uh, to uh, be alive in the world. So the new way of do doing research is a much more um, structured and data-centric uh, aspect, um, whereby by publishing and sharing data, and, and publishing and sharing data are not always the same thing, which I'll explain later, um, the evidence which underpins the scientific, the scholarly record, can be made uh, available for the longer term, in that somebody can come along 20 years from now, look at uh, a research paper which you published, and they can still access the data uh, they can still attempt to rerun the experiment or reproduce the findings if, if working in a, in a discipline where that is uh, indeed possible. Um, and the reuse of data, uh, the, 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 the purpose of preserving data for the long term is to make it accessible for the longer term. And when things are accessible for the longer term, they can be reused either for the same purpose they were collected or in many cases for purposes entirely different for the, for the, um, the, that the data was actually uh, created for. So research data management is defined as the active management and appraisal uh, of data over the life cycle of scholarly and scientific interest. And as I mentioned, the life cycle or the lifetime of scholarly and scientific interest may be considerably longer than the lifetime of the scholar who collects the data in the first place. But the important word here, the key word, is active. Research data management is not something which happens uh, of its own accord. It's something which requires direct uh, intervention from a variety of stakeholders throughout uh, the process. The types of activities that this includes uh, would be planning and describing data-related activity before it takes place, documenting data via metadata uh, so that others can find and understand it, storing data safely during the project. That's particularly important if you're dealing with sensitive data, be it ethically sensitive or commercially sensitive data depositing the data in a trusted archive towards the end of the project, and, and this is crucial, linking the publications to the data sets which underpin them, leading to a richer and a more integral uh, scholarly record. So it's not just people like me who uh, say that this is a good thing. Uh, the RCUK, which is the umbrella body of funders in the United Kingdom, uh, suggests that data management is a part of good research practice. Uh, and there have been uh, blog posts and opinion pieces recently uh, from people suggesting that failure to allow access to or share data goes beyond bad practice and into malpractice. It's something which, uh, because it's possible and because it's desirable, should be a normal part of researchers' uh, working uh, processes. So I was asked to, to, to cover sensitive data here. So I've got a kind of a, a timeout type slide talking about um, the difference between data management and data sharing. The two terms are often used uh, interchangeably, but they're not the same thing. Uh, there is no um, sharing without management, um, but managing a data set does not mean making it available for everyone to access. Uh, there, are, there are conditions such as ethical sensitivities, commercial, commercial sensitivities, which, would, which uh, mean that the researcher ought not to do it or should uh, or must not do it. So data can be sensitive for two reasons. Ethically sensitive data will often correspond to living human subjects. Uh, now, living humans have rights, uh, in most countries anyway. Um, and uh, th those rights have to be respected, and they're, and they're protected by law. Um, so that if you are uh, handling sensitive data which relates to living humans and you fail to meet your legal obligations, there is a possibility that you could be prosecuted. 
Um, if you fail to meet the obligations of your research funder in terms of their policy, you won't end up in court. Uh, you may find yourself unable to get funding from that, uh, that, from that source uh, again, but the, 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 the kind of ultimate driver here is, is the law, uh, and, and, and the, um, the provision for data protection varies very much for, uh, from, uh, from country to country. Uh, there are other areas where data should not um, or, or be um, shared um, willy-nilly uh, include you know, security areas such as uh, nuclear science uh, and infectious diseases. It's not in the in humanity's interest for everyone uh, to be able to access um, data relating to uh, Ebola studies, for example. Um, on the other side of this, there are sensitivities regarding um, commercially sensitive data. Um, at a very fundamental level, data can be the difference between a, um, a company succeeding or failing. It, it's the competitive advantage that it might have over its, uh, its competitors. Now, private sector data is not usually expected to be shared. It's, it, it's, it's owned by the, the private sector, in, it, but the, which makes it different from research data funded by the taxpayer or carried out within public uh, universities. What one, uh, one area where this is not the case is in clinical trials. There's, a, there's obviously a very large public interest uh, aspect to the data relating to clinical trials being made available so that drug companies can't, <laughs> uh, can't uh, boost their figures or um, enhance the, uh, the benefits of a particular medicine in order to sell it to, um, to governments and to sick people. Um, increasingly, and this is, this is very much the case within the European context, uh, there is um, a, a, an increase in partnerships between the public and the private sector, uh, to, two areas which sometimes have quite different drive, uh, drivers. Uh, so conflicts can arise here, and the, the best way for that to be uh, dealt with is via something called data management planning, and I'll talk more about that uh, afterwards. Um, if you want or need to uh, license uh, research data, uh, it can be done. There are various uh, levels of um, accessibility from something like CC0, where you say, here's the data, do what you want with it, to, um, to, to um, non-commercial type licenses, where you say, here's the data, you can use it for anything as long as you don't charge money for it, or that you don't change it, or, or all sorts of things like that. And, and I just wanted to point towards a DCC um, publication, which, which helps uh, with that kind of guidance. So research data management is not the sole concern of researchers. It's not something which only librarians need to think about. Uh, in some, t some cases, when people hear about this for the first time, they hear data and they think, oh, that must be the computing department, the IT people. It actually involves all of these, uh, these um, groups of stakeholder. And What's important is not for everyone to be an expert in every aspect of research data management, but simply to know what your role is within the, 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 the greater activity. So data management planning is not only a, a process of planning for data so that it lasts for a long time, it's also a communication activity uh, to help people within universities or across multi-partner, uh, maybe even international collaborations uh, to keep sensitive data safe first and foremost to maximize the reuse potential of data and to support its longer term uh, preservation. Um, and and when, when occasionally when we talk about research data management, um, researchers can say, okay, you're asking me to do lots more work here without much in the way of uh, reward. Uh, why should I do this so that somebody else can come along five years from now and benefit from it? And we quite often say, well, you may want to access your own data five years down the line. If you think of yourself as being the first reuser of your data, uh, then it's, it's important for you to describe it adequately and to ensure that it is still accessible uh, years down the line. So uh, we, we appeal often to what we would call enlightened self-interest. So the benefits of, very quickly, the benefits of research data management and data sharing um, are, I would say, fivefold. First of all, open publications and open data, um, publications based on data will receive more citations therefore have a higher impact factor over a longer period. They will continue to be cited for longer than they would uh, otherwise. Um, there's the transparency and quality, the academic standards aspect, which says that the evidence that underpins 
research can be made open for anyone to scrutinize, and they can attempt to rep replicate findings or at least reproduce the process under which the uh, research was carried out. And what that leads to is a much more robust, uh, a, a firmer scholarly record. Uh, there's the efficiency argument, which, which uh, governments and funders are very keen on, which says that data can be collected once, uh, that, and that collection is paid for, but the data can be used, reaccessed, reused a number of times for a number of purposes with very little additional cost. Therefore, the return on investment uh, increases considerably. Um, and finally, there's the accessibility uh, aspect, which says that interested third parties, be these uh, in academia, in, in the scholarly world, be these in the commercial world, be these in government uh, policy uh, units, can access and build upon publicly funded research resources with minimal barriers to access. And those barriers could be either financial barriers, physical barriers, or barriers in terms of time. Uh, but making things available quickly is important in certain uh, academic disciplines. Um, so here's some evidence for, for these claims. A study uh, by uh, Heather Pivovar and Todd Vision from a couple of years ago found that uh, studies in genomics, uh, where the data was made available, um, those studies received 9% higher um, citations, and that reuse by, the, by third parties, as in continuing impact, uh, was still increasing after six years. And six years, as some of you will know, is quite a long time in genomics, so this is quite an, an, impressive, uh, an impressive statistic. Uh, there's the quality aspect, which, which is the, something that um, universities and, and scholars in general are, um, are um, interested in from a very fundamental basis. Data is necessary to reproduce research, in particular in computational disciplines, in the harder sciences. Um, and this is Victoria Stodden, who uh, works at MIT in the United States. She also says that an equal amount of concern should be directed at code sharing. Uh, there are many disciplines where simply having the data behind something without um, having the algorithms or the code which was used to process that is a very limited value. So when we talk about data, we talk about a very broad church. It's not only uh, uh, numbers, but it can be audiovisual information, it can be descriptions, it can be workflows, all kinds of things that help people to have uh, a stronger, a longer lasting and a richer understanding of research. Uh, there's financial benefits. Uh, we have a, um, a counterpart organization in Australia, which is called the Australian National Data Service, and they commissioned a study recently that found that the amount of uh, the, the monetary value uh, of data in Australia's public universities it was around about two billion on a conservative estimate, two billion Australian dollars, uh, and possibly up to six billion dollars uh, per year. And this is untapped uh, potential uh, that, um, in particular, the governments will be looking and the funders will be looking at quite closely because this is something that they will want to uh, exploit and make uh, the most of. Um, it's not. This is not restricted, I should say, to the scholarly um, community to the academic community. Uh, McKinsey um, and Company, uh, which is one of the world's very large consultancies, uh, has, has studied the potential value of open data across a number of domains from travel to healthcare to economics, all sorts of things. Uh, and and they, they came up with a very, uh, <laughs> a very large number of $3 trillion, which was the potential annual value. I think that they pro possibly didn't err on the side of conservatism there. Um, but the fact that the big consultancies are looking at this, the fact that you will see the term big data increasingly on the front cover of uh, not only scientific magazines but business journals and what have you, uh, it, it serves as an indicator that data and data management is, is something which transcends the, the, the academic uh, realm. And finally, the, the, a benefit of timely research data management is speed. Uh, Bryn Nelson. Uh, six years ago, uh, wrote in Nature that if we're going to wait five years for data to be released, the Arctic is going to be a very different place. And when the Arctic becomes a different place, uh, the, the lower-lying countries um, and people who live near the sea uh, experience change uh, as well. And the Arctic is indeed a very different place there. There are areas of scholarly research where we don't have a lot of time uh, if, we're going, if, if the world is going to look similar to the way it does uh, in, in 10 or 20 years. Therefore, the timely sharing of data, enabling other people to use it, to access it, to check, um, to check its veracity, uh, is very important in certain areas. So this, I, I'm sure you'll agree that this all sounds really good. 
but yet we don't uh, live in a data sharing utopia. Now, wh why would this be? First of all, there is still a, a lack of widespread understanding of the fundamental issues. There's still a necessity for people like me to come and, and speak at events like this, so that next year more hands go up when I ask who's heard of uh, open access to uh, research data. There's a lack of joined up thinking uh, within institutions. As I mentioned, it's a hybrid activity which requires input from uh, various different services. Uh, but there's also a lack of thinking within countries, as in could we be doing things more quickly, more efficiently? Uh, could we be working with international partners in order to do this more quickly? And indeed, there is lots of work around the Research Data Alliance, around European Union type work to bring ind uh, you know, individual countries together to, to, to work smarter. Uh, there are issues around ownership and privacy which need to be addressed. As I mentioned, uh, sensitive data should be treated carefully. That doesn't mean that it can't be shared and reused uh, if appropriate steps are taken. Uh, you may, you may uh, anonymize data so that individuals can't be uh, identified. Uh, you may aggregate it so that you're, you're, you're not dealing at a very granular individual level. Uh, there are technical and financial limitations, uh, and not all data should be st stored for the longer term because storing data and um, in, in ingesting it into repositories takes time and costs money. Um, and there, there, there still remain issues around reward and recognition for researchers. Why should I spend time and effort doing this um, uh, so that somebody else can benefit from it? This is beginning to be addressed by funders and by the people who um, run promotions committees, uh, who uh, run research um, uh, excellence um, exercises and that kind of thing, so that people who invest time in preparing something and making it available for the scholarly community receive the appropriate reward and recognition. In some cases, you can be cited uh, for your, uh, the data which you've created. In, in, in other disciplines, it's normal for the creators of data sets to be given as co-authors if, if, if the, um, the publication lent very um, heavily on, on their original work. So what does this actually mean for researchers? Well, the, the first, there's no way to sugar this pill. It is a disruption to working processes. Researchers are being asked to do something additional, uh, oftentimes without getting any additional incentive, and in, in, in almost all cases without being uh, told, OK, you have to do this now, but you don't have to do this anymore. They still have to do that, but they also have to do this now. Um, so it's a disruption to working processes, and people tend not to like disruptions to their working processes. There are additional expectations and requirements from funders, and sometimes those uh, expectations come not only from the funder, but from the institution and from the publisher. If you want to publish in nature or science, you're obliged to um, submit your data and make it available um, alongside the paper. They see that as being a quality issue, nature and science um, uh, publish very high quality journals and they, th they think that their reputation rests on uh, the quality of the uh, research which they publish. The quality of the research that they publish uh, rests upon the availability of the data which serves as evidence for it. So that's the bad news. The good news is that research data management and taking an active approach to, to data will provide opportunities for new types of investigation. Uh, the, the advent of uh, networked technology has led to a situation where studies can be done um, virtually, studies can be done on a collaborative international basis. It simply were not possible before uh, the internet, before uh, we all had um, uh, powerful computers in our pockets. Uh, and and uh, I, I can't stress this enough, research data management leads to a more robust scholarly record. This is something which uh, is, is a fundamental uh, quality issue, with something with, with which universities and publishers are, uh, are, are very much uh, invested in. So what do researchers actually need to do? And not just researchers, but what do librarians need to do? What do uh, IT people, funding offices need to do? First of all, it's important that researchers understand their, what's expected of them, that they understand the funders' policies. And, and um, as Victoria mentioned earlier, the Horizon 2020 um, European Framework Programme has an open data pilot. So if you're doing research within Horizon 2020, you will very likely be covered uh, by that pilot. Uh, you will need to submit three versions of our data management plan uh, at, at different stages of the, uh, of the research. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, as, as I go on. Um, you should be aware of your intended um, publisher's open access policy and, and make sure that that is compatible with your institution's policy, with your funder's policy, uh, so that uh, sometimes these things can be in conflict and there may need to be some uh, negotiation. Uh, you may wish to create a data management plan, and uh, the DCC have a tool called DMP Online, which we're working with the European Commission to, to build into 
European uh, data infrastructures. Uh, decide which data you're going to preserve. Uh, identify a long-term home for your data. Not um, Some research funders mandate a place of deposit. So for example, if you work in the UK in social sciences and you're funded by the public social science funder, you're obliged to submit your research data to the UK data archive. If you work in the arts and humanities, uh, that there's no obligation of that sort and there's also no natural home for uh, the data. So not every discipline is as well served um, as each other. Um, so you can use a service like Re3Data, which is a registry of, uh, of open data uh, repositories to help you to find a place to store it for the longer term. Researchers should look to um, link data to publications using something called a persistent identifier. Uh, the most uh, common uh, or the best known of these is is the DOI, the Digital Object Identifier. And, and most repositories nowadays will do that uh, on your behalf. So if you submit your data to a service like Zenodo, which is run by CERN in, in uh, Switzerland, uh, they, they'll do that for you. Uh, and finally, if you're working in the European context, it's useful to investigate um, the, the Europe's infrastructure services like UDAT, which helps with technical infrastructure, Foster, the project which I'm representing today, which deals with uh, human infrastructure, Open Air Plus, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I mentioned, and I'll, how much time have I taken and how much time do I have left? About five minutes left. What I won't do then is go into a huge amount of detail about the policy because these slides will be made available immediately afterwards and you can, uh, you can look at the policy for yourself. It also may not be relevant to everyone. Um, but just, just to be aware that Horizon 2020 features an open research data pilot. I mentioned at the very, very beginning that the conversations around open access to publications and open data mirror each other one cycle uh, down the line. Now, FP7 had an open access to publications pilot, and now FP8 has an open access mandate. Uh, FP8 has an open data pilot, and if I, was, uh, if I was to predict the future, I would suspect uh, that FP9, in, around, in or around uh, 2020, uh, it will become mandatory across the board. That's, that's the prediction, that's not policy just yet. So, I mentioned that the, the term data can be quite a broad term, and, and what the, um, the European Commission are interested in is not only the data itself, which underpins the publications, but metadata, which enables people to understand it, to discover it, uh, etc. It also covers things like uh, code, which, without which some uh, research is, is not understandable. Uh, I'm going to skip over these two slides, which are the very specific things about Horizon 2020, but I would encourage you, if you're currently working on a Horizon 2020 um, project or bid or expect to be so in the future to, to take a look. Um, so I'll conclude just with some uh, useful resources around research data management. Uh, DMP Online is the DCC's web-based tool to help researchers and librarians and research support people to write and maintain data management plans. And as I mentioned, these are a requirement of an increasing number of, of uh, research funders. In the UK, all of the publicly funded uh, all of the public research funders uh, require or expect data management plans. It's common in uh, North America, it's common in South Africa, it's uh, common in uh, Australia, and it's, it's, it's going to be part of uh, European research very, very soon. So this is something which there's, there's, uh, the, the, there's certainly uh, I, I need to know about it. Uh, and what DMP Online does is it, um, pr it provides a, a simple way of uh, meeting your funders' expectations. It also, also has opportunities for awareness raising and training and things like that uh, w w within uh, the tool. And we're working with um, uh, UDAT, the UDAT project, to integrate DMP Online within uh, the European um, common technical data uh, infrastructure. Um, Zenodo is a really uh, a great resource to know about. It's a free to use uh, data repository which is run and maintained by the people at CERN. Basically, the, 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 the data managers at CERN came to the conclusion that they were dealing with such vast amounts of, of data themselves that they could throw open uh, their uh, resources to everyone to use for free uh, and it wouldn't cost them anything extra and it wouldn't cost them any extra time. So this is a service that they're providing for free to the community for uh, the lifetime uh, of CERN. It, access, it accepts any kind of data from any academic discipline, um, it, and, it's, uh, and as I said, it's free to use, so it's a fantastic resource at least to be aware of. Um, we have a number of data management planning, in particular related uh, resources. It's one of my um, sort of uh, pet interests, uh, so I would encourage you to, to look at some of the DCC's 
uh, resources there. And there are some other really great research data management resources produced. Um, th these are all UK um, uh, resources. The UK Data Archive is the mandated social science archive within the UK. And there's also guidance from uh, other funders like Economic and Social Research Council and the Natural Environment Research Council. The reason why those two particular councils are so strong is because they deal principally with observational data, social sciences, environmental studies. You don't get a second chance to run a census. There's no second chance to observe uh, climate uh, change. So that data is not replicable. Uh, it may be that if you're working in high energy physics, um, you could run an experiment 100 times and you would get the, same, the exact same data and the exact same result 100 times. That's not so in, in, uh, in observational uh, type research. So it's very important that that data in particular is, uh, is treated with the, uh, with the care and attention that it needs. Um, the FOSTER project is the European uh, kind of human infrastructure training project which has is, uh, is sponsored this event. Um, and I would encourage you to take a look at the FOSTER uh, website for more information about uh, training opportunities, webinars, and if you've uh, uh, found a, developed a new found interest in research data management, I'd be very happy to talk um, uh, over the course of today or afterwards via uh, email or Twitter or whatever uh, means uh, you prefer. So um, thank you very much.